Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. In today's podcast, we're going to cover why people won't pay for automation code. Yeah, it's going to be a great one. Hey, it's Joe Glides here from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie Stook here from Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, and so today in our podcast, our 101st podcast, uh, it's a crazy number, we're going to cover um, why people don't pay for automation code. Now, of course, they, they do, and they'll pay big, and we'll get into this later for, for some stuff, but we're talking more about things that we're automating you know, ourselves, uh, doing them on, on, on programs, um, and it, usually a bit smaller of a scale than you know, a huge dollar bill thing. Um, the very first one is people you know, are using a program and they don't realize you could write another program, um, use a, like let's say AutoHotKey to automate that process in that program and speed it up, right? It's just a simple fact. They don't even know if I have a tedious process where I'm let's say doing web scraping or going this and that, I can actually automate that process. I don't have to do that manually. It's just a huge thing people aren't even aware of. Yeah, yeah. The simple fact of, of realizing that just parts of whatever you're doing, if you're doing it over and over, you, you should, you could save quite a lot of time by automating it. Uh, so, so yeah, it's just that people don't even realize that it exists is a sad part of it because, hey, yeah, uh, we, we can really benefit from, from that in our own day so you don't get numbed by the mundane tasks that we do. So, yeah, I'd say the second one here, um, it can kind of be, it's a thanks to the companies like Automation Anywhere, the person, so, they, they make people think that automation costs a fortune. So it, it's great that they're out there, they're doing automation and helping people, but most people that never have researched it themselves only have these almost enterprise level program prices in their head and automation doesn't need to cost that much. If, if you have someone, who's willing or able to do uh, parts of it while they're doing the task anyway, yeah, you're probably not paying that much extra for having it automated, so. Well, in, in reality, you usually save money, right? At least w once a person has a little bit of a clue about what they're doing versus with Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, you know, those kind of companies, often they spend like $2,000 a day. They charge people that to have an engineer come to your site and start developing the program for weeks at a time. Like, I mean, that, that's a, it starts being a staggering amount. Besides the licensing fees, they throw on top of everything, right? It's a crazy amount of money. Here's the thing, though, is they, they have a lot of other things they, they get with that, right? One of the, be able to track what happens and exactly have a, you know, a, a, a logging system to go back in and see who did what and when and exactly what happened. Um, another one is, now, there's always, almost always exceptions, right? So rarely do you actually automate everything. However, they will try to automate the entire process, and there'll still be exceptions where humans have to deal with, but they'll still often try to automate the entire process. We typically say, you know what? I might automate, you know, 80% of it or 60, or I might spend 20 minutes to automate the first really big pain in the butt part, and that's good enough, right? And, and it took me 15 or 20 minutes or even an hour to automate it, but now I save, you know, minutes every time I use it. And it's something I use several times a day or a week. And it very quickly pays for itself, given, you know, how often we use it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this idea of automation costing a fortune is not necessarily wrong. Depends on whichever tool you, you end up using. But it, it's not a fact. No, right, yeah, and, and with uh, obviously with AutoHockey or AutoIt is another one. They're both free, open. Well, AutoHockey is open source, AutoIt isn't, but you can still develop stuff with AutoIt and use it. That's fine. Um, another one, which really, I, I think this is subconsciously, it's a big thing, right? People have this belief. Let's say I'm doing something in Excel or what, or or I have a website where I've done stuff. I've already paid, you know, for this program or whatever it is I'm using. I, it feels kind of insulting to say, hey, maybe you should pay someone or, you know, write a program to help it work faster, 
right? Like that seems, I think for some people, you're like, I already paid $200 for, you know, this thing. Why would I pay more money to, to, you know, interact with it? It should be good. Enough. Well, yeah, you know what? It should be good enough. But if it really is slowing you down, it's worth that extra money to just tune it up and make it work even faster. Yeah, this one also falls into some of the things that we've covered in other podcasts. The, the idea of people working in programs that do calculations or word processing or whatever it is, but most of the time the people using them ain't even that high of a user level in those programs. So you have Excel, you have all of the functionality of Excel, which is very vast. And a lot of people only use a fraction of that. Uh, so they might keep making new pivot tables or they might keep making new uh, functions for whatever and stuff like that. And they might not even touch that. They just get the data and look at it and do manual stuff with it without using any of the advanced tools that Excel really tries to give you. Um, just the one I think you mentioned it last time was string to columns. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's, it's such a simple one that you click the button and it will give you a wizard asking you, do you want to split on the commas or on the tabs or whatever, and will do everything for you. And it can do it with, who knows, 64,000 rows uh, in in a split second or something right. like that. So, yeah, it, it, it really is something where people already have bought a product and they don't even use that fully. So for them to move beyond that and ask for help when they don't even get a course in using it better. So, yeah, people might be like, yeah, okay, I could pay someone to automate this in that. I could also get better at it, but I won't, and so on and so forth. So yeah, we also have the next one where the people paying for the code know very little about coding and thus can't evaluate the code well or, or the task or the stuff that you have actually done for them. So this one is one of those where I'd say, yeah, yeah, people might ask for something and then when you come back with something that works, they'd be like, yeah, it doesn't do it exactly as I wanted, or why did it take you that long, or stuff like that. You know, you know what it is? It, 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 this this dates how, how old I am. Maybe it's a little too old for you, too. Uh, the, the Days of Thunder, Tom, Tom Cruise movie where he's a race car driver, and he's talking to, I can't think of that guy's name, but um, he's a famous actor, too. And uh, they're, they're talking about, like, you know, how he's driving and stuff, and he... And he Tom Cruise finally lets on. He's like, you don't understand. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I when you're talking about the little this and that, I don't know how to describe what's going on with the car and this and that. And this is one of those things when people buy, you know, the, the they're paying for something, they don't have the vocabulary and the know-how to explain first what they want in the first place, which often you and I know. The first thing I do with when I'm working with someone is take a step back and really make sure I understand exactly what they're trying to do, you know, all the things about it, not just hey, do this one thing. It's, why do you want to do that thing? Let's let's look at the big picture, right? Let's make sure we're doing the right thing because often people don't even know what they want in the first place um, and there's better ways to do it. But when you go to evaluate like, oh, did it work well and stuff? Well, a lot of the times it'll be their fault because it didn't, it didn't work well or they just don't know how to evaluate it. So the easier way, nobody likes to work with something that they don't understand, right? You, you feel incompetent. And so it's just a place where most people don't want to go. So they just don't go and they put up with, uh, well, it just takes a little bit longer to do, or even though there's more human errors or, you know, it takes more time. Yeah, I've, I've seen that multiple times over when making a small automation for people. Um, you, you'll you give them it as user-friendly as, as you felt you could without using overly much time on making it user-friendly. And, and they don't use it for... Uh, some amount of time and they therefore forget the small instructions that we gave them. And the next time they open it, 
if you're readily available, if you're like a colleague or something like that, they might ask you and, and get it reevaluated and relearn how to use it. But if it's something they bought a month ago and they haven't used it much since, it still saves them quite a lot of time. But when they open it and they don't immediately can make it work from whatever instructions we gave them, they'll be like, yeah, but it doesn't work. And they'll either contact you and say it doesn't work without right. explaining what doesn't work, or they'll stop using it. Right, yeah. But, yeah. With the end being in the long run, they, it, it's kind of like when I used to work in market research, people would say, oh, research, it's really crap. Research just doesn't work anymore because I did some research and it didn't, you know, the results were totally wrong. But, well, 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 you know what? Maybe if you actually hired someone that knew what they were doing, it would, you know, it would work properly. It's not research in general. It's not the automation in general that's failing. It's how you're using it, you know, that is probably failing. Um, and, and then let's even get with specifically around like auto hockey in particular, right? One of the strengths of auto hockey is it's a super, super easy to learn language, um, which is great. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we'll see posts like in the forum saying, Hey, I'm looking to hire someone to do X project. Well, they hire the first person that jumps out there and not all coders are equal, right? Um, most people, you start off sending keystrokes and mouse movements, which can work okay, but there are far superior ways to doing stuff. Um, and especially if you're going to use stuff on multiple computers, they'll break, right? And when you end up hiring someone, and again, it's just the same thing as that last one. It turns you off because you're like, oh, it doesn't really work. That doesn't work. And it's, well, it, it's not that the, the auto hockey that didn't work necessarily. It's how the code that you got wasn't robust. Um, but unfortunately, again, they don't know how to evaluate the people um, or, or anything. So it's, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah, totally. And as you said yourself, the developer you hire and in smaller um, forum type situations like the uh, hotkey one, where you don't really have that big of a bucket to choose from because you only get a few uh, fish biting on any of those because either it feels frowned upon or can I even do this here? And there is a myth about you not being allowed to sell a uh, hotkey code and stuff like that. There's all kind of stuff in there built into people not uh, moving on hiring. But when they then do, most of the time, it seems as if the thread with this hiring process is very short. Someone jumps on it, and apparently the person on the other end, the buyer, was in such a hurry that they immediately chose that person to do it. Uh, either because the person offered to do it very cheaply or just because nobody else came on for eight hours or whatever. Right. So, so yeah, it, it kind of feels like there are some types of, of evaluation missing there. Yeah, I agree. And then the last one here, actually, let me, let me jump on the last one. I think I did the one before, but let me handle this one too. Just because for me, it's uh, it's one of those things. I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews with auto hockey gurus. Um, obviously, you were one of them. Ironically, you were one of my last, the last ones I did out of all of them. It's, it's kind of funny. And I did like 20 or 30 or so. And it took me a while to put my finger on it. But what I realized was the common thread out of every person I talked to was, and, and I think all but one, no, maybe two, had a background in programming, right? The vast majority did not have any background in programming. They stumbled in auto hockey because they they needed to solve a problem, right? And they and and they were go getters and wanted to learn how to solve it. And then, like they usually solved that one problem, and they started adapting it into other things and realized what it could do. And that's what really I think this answer is: the mindset of people who. Um, I'm not going to hire someone to do this. It's something I can figure out, right? Which, which often I would 90% agree with that. However, um, if you are willing to spend a little bit of money and hire someone who knows more than you, you can get them, you can use it as a way to level up, right? You pick your project, spend a little bit of money to have someone who really knows. It doesn't have to, it just, wherever you are, as long as they're a little more advanced than you, 
and they, they program in a different way. And then you, because it's your example, it's so much easier to follow and understand and make sense. Right. And then you learn that new approach. Right. And so you can use that next time. Yeah. And I've, I've seen multiple times over in Facebook and in other places, chats and then the forum for that matter, people after someone offers to do it for a small fee, someone will immediately jump on it and say, oh, you don't need to pay for that. I, I can do a, a pseudo code or a, yeah. write that small thing. And within reason, that's okay. When, when the requests are, how do I send the left arrow key? Fair enough. Doesn't really have to pay someone for that because yeah. you could probably have read it in the tutorial and if someone wants to copy paste that form, that's fine. But other times it's like, it's probably not needed for you to save him three bucks just because you thought that this was an easy task because the other two people could actually learn something and that would have been a small payment in exchange that probably wouldn't have hurt either them or the community as a whole. Yeah, and, and let me add on to this general conversation of, I, I used to hate, and I still don't like the general feeling of saying I'm gonna get paid for a given project by working by the hour. Um, I'll just, you know, I'd like to bid it, however, it, it would between because mostly a project scope, and if you don't, you know, if you don't pay by the hour, the nobody, well, the client side, they they want they ask they have things changing all the time, or things aren't specific, uh, or they just want to have calls and talk and talk and talk. And you know, I always end up losing money. Um, so I'm like, you know what? I, I'll bid by the hour. Typically, we go at around thirty five bucks an hour, um, which to me isn't it's a reasonable price. You know. Um, I know it differs. Now you can find people in other countries that have a cheaper cost of living and possibly get it for a, a lower price per hour. Now, what I think the most important point is don't just go for the lowest price, right? First, make sure whatever approach they're taking that they, A, I'd say they know, make sure they understand several approaches before they decide on one, right? And say, okay, well, what are my options, right? Um, and then that way you don't want someone who only knows, what was the example you said earlier? Oh yeah, I think it was with Excel doing pivot table after pivot table after pivot. It's like the whole, hey, I have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? Like if some people only know one approach, that's all they're going to do. And it's objects are amazing things. That's one thing I've learned is like, man, people who know what they're doing can use objects in ways I would never imagine um, and really streamline and make it so much easier to understand. And once you see it laid out, I was doing stuff with Maestri at the ton of times where he'd program something. And I'd go like, what is, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, well, this, I'm, I'm stuffing it in here. And this is, and I go, oh my God, I, I get it. It's, I couldn't write it myself, but maintaining it and tweaking it, it's because it's easy, you know, once I see that example. So um, I, I highly encourage you to make sure people have a, at least a few tools in their tool bag um, before you pick the first one that says this is the right approach this way, right? Um but yeah, those are food for thought. I know a lot of people can be frustrated when they get to a plateau in their learning. And within reason, most people could probably find a mentor or someone else and do like you did. And as you said, if you pay someone by the hour or some other setup or arrangement, you could probably be there, see them live coding the issue you had and learn at the same time as you got your automation done. So, so yeah, that's that was exactly what I recommended to someone they were, we were talking about. He, he wanted to have uh, someone code for him. And I said, look, if you have the time, I highly encourage you to, while you're paying him, be on a zoom chat and watch him. And yeah, it's going to add a little more time because he's going to explain stuff to you, but you will level up. I guarantee you like you never would any other way, right? It's, it's so different when you watch it developing in front of you and you can go, wait a minute, what were you doing here? Um, and, and it's just, and they can explain it to you until you get it. It's that interaction, the live interaction back and forth, right? That's what doing stuff in Zoom or like Discord kind of thing where you're live interactively Q&A back and forth. Change, mm -hmm. It's a game changer, right? It makes it so much easier. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed that. Make sure you uh, like and comment uh, on, on the podcast. Yeah, let's hear what you think. All right. See you later, Jackie. Yeah, bye. 
So thanks for listening to the podcast and please remember to comment and let us know what you enjoyed about that. And if you have any questions, you know, add in there because uh, it's really great to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed that episode of the Automators podcast, you might also like this one. Hey, today we're going to cover why macros ain't popular anymore. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's going to be great. If you like that, make sure you go to pod.theautomator.com and look for it.